The first thing I would like to say is that due to the way uh, the classrooms system that he's made formats the names of projects, uh, my homework ended up being called Workout 5G, and I think that's hilarious. Anyway, on to part two. I think uh, the first and most important problem with doing this homework is figuring out what you're even supposed to do in the first place. So this, this is the exercises file. This is what you're supposed to manipulate. This is the homework, essentially. And so he tells you here that he wants you to implement these four functions. And unfortunately, the information here isn't really what you need. So how I went about this is we understand the function syntax here. We understand that this is a function which takes an expression and converts it to whatever the hell this is, and we need to turn this undefined into code. Now, I know when I was working on this with someone else earlier, their first in instinct was to Google what the hell an accumulator is, and that is a good starting point. Unfortunately, it was not entirely on... Oh, that... Mm, great. It was not entirely on the ball because we are not using the Haskell accumulator. We are using the custom accumulator code that he made for us, included with this project. So your first step should be to open up accum.hs and expert.hs and figure out what all of these are. Fundamentally, what this homework is asking you to do is to take expressions, which is sort of a custom data type he's made, which lets you represent huge math functions as a node tree. And he wants you to manipulate these in various ways. The first exercise, uh, extract lets wants you to go through a sort of equation tree like this and get rid of all the let statements. So to illustrate this a bit better, he has included these tests, which he didn't tell you about, <laughs> but these tell you what you're supposed to do. If you look at public tests.h, you'll see that if you call extract lets e1, the result should be R1. So, looking at E1, this is what it is. If this reminds you of the binary trees that we did before, well, that's because it is basically the same. Each one of these mathematical expressions can have another mathematical expression uh, inside of it, and sometimes it will have two, maybe three. I believe the largest let, which is what you're supposed to be removing, can have three separate arguments inside of it. And many of the solutions for this homework are going to greatly resemble the homework where we had to traverse and manipulate binary trees. So if you did well on that homework, then I'd look over your homework solutions and see if you can apply some of the same principles here. And if you didn't do well on that homework, I'd go back and look at his slides when he talked about traversing trees and maybe ask other people about their homework solutions because I'm pretty sure we can talk about the solutions to past homeworks now. Although I would ask a teacher or a TA to verify first before you accidentally get slapped with something. But just to talk about the types themselves and how they work, we need to be able to read this text right here. Uh, specifically this one, because this defines what an expression is, and it's really hard to do this assignment without knowing what an expression is because when you traverse a tree, you need to be able to understand the structure of it. So, to that end, expressions as he has them here, this is how he defines it. This is what the line looks like. Data expr equals, and then all of this, and then deriving all of this. What that means, and I sort of translated this into pseudo Java, is that he's creating an abstract class called expr, that implements all of these things. Read is a function, and because it derives read, you know that you can call read on expert. Because it derives show, you know you can call show on expert. These are just things that you can call on it. That's all it means. And meanwhile, because it equals all of these things, it's not a concrete object itself. That's why I called it abstract. You can never say new expr in Haskell. It is just a category that other classes fit into. Each one of these things, separated by this pipe character, each one of these is a type of expression. And so this whole line here, 
can be summed up in this Java code, all of this. And this is honestly one of the things that Haskell really has going for it. It can do in one line what takes Java all of this. So you can see int is a type of data which extends expr, which means it implements all of these uh, interfaces. And its constructor takes a single int. That's what int int means. And I know that's really confusing, but despite having int twice, these two words mean different things. This first int means that's the name of the type. One of the children of expr is called int. And then the second int means that the constructor, very heavy air quotes there, takes a single integer as an argument. So if I were to say call int 5, that would return an int object, which is also an expr, which holds the number 5 inside of it. That one's relatively simple. It's basically a wrapper for an integer, which allows you to put that integer into functions which demand an expression from you. To maybe point out why that would be helpful, this function extract lets expects an expression. So you could not say extract lets 5, because it doesn't know how to call extract lets on the number 5. However, if I say uh, extract lets int 5, well, this calls the constructor function int on the number 5, and this whole thing is now an int type, which just happens to be holding the number 5, and because int is a child of expression, I can now call extract lets on it. This will compile, this will run, it won't do much because there's no tree to traverse, but it will run, it will accept it, this is valid Haskell code. Similarly, add, as defined up here, also extends expression, and it takes two values, which are further expressions. This is how you get the recursive tree structure. So if you look at the expr file, you can see that add, the first argument it takes is int3, which is an expression, and then the second thing it takes is all of this, because all of this is an expression. Because they are recursively defined like this, an expression can be as simple as the number 3, or as complicated as whatever the hell this is. Meanwhile, malt is the same. It takes two expressions as an argument in its constructor, and use takes this thing called var as an argument, as you can see up here. And earlier, var is just defined as a wrapper for a string, the same way int is a wrapper for an integer. And since this only has one thing on its line, as opposed to expr, which has a multitude of children, var will only ever be a wrapper for a string. So whenever you see the word var in your code, whether it's in the documentation for expr here, or whether it's in here, because you will need to use vars, at least down here, you know that that basically just means a string that's inside of a container, the same way you might put a string inside of a list or inside of a hash map. Var is just a container that holds one thing. So that's what expressions are. They are a means of recursively defining binary trees where there are multiple types of nodes. That's effectively what we're doing here. Before, we defined nodes that only had one type that held exactly two children. Exper is effectively a type of node that has certain uh, different types representing different things, which allow us to represent math. So to go into more detail about what they want us to do for this, the first problem, extract lets. As described up here, I'm going to summarize his words, it wants you to go through a whole node tree of math, and it wants you to surgically remove all the let statements. If you were listening in class, and I wouldn't blame you if you weren't, when he explained let statements, uh, how they work syntactically is you say, let variable equal variable value in a bunch of code where you use that variable. So you can see here, you are adding the number three to let x equal four in all this code. And then in all this code, you can see use variable x, use variable x, x is referenced. And when it is referenced, it's replaced with four. So what they want you to do is basically create a structure like this, 
where you have these use statements, but where you don't have any let statements to tell you what the variables are equal to. This is the after, this is before, and you can see the structure is the same. You have add int3, add int3, and then the second argument basically skips the let statement and goes straight to add use var x, and you can see it goes straight from int3 to add use var x. Does, uh, does that much make sense to everyone? At least what we're supposed to do in terms of the tree? Yes. Okay, I'll take one. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. All right, all right, two is good enough for me. However, it doesn't just want you to modify the tree. It also wants you to use an accumulator to track all the variable values inside of that tree. So you can see here, let var x equal int 4, and then here it just has var x and int 4. This is, this is a list of pairs where the first thing is the name of the variable, and the second thing is whatever the value is. So here you have let y, variable y, equal multiply x by 3, and this has multiple multiply x by 3. So you need to do two things in one function. One you need to alter the tree to get rid of all the let statements. And two, you need to track all the variable values in this thing called an accumulator. So, next, we need to move from the expression file to the accumulator file and see what the hell this is. Now, while expression was basically just defined as a bunch of structures that hold other variables, Accumulator is a bit more complex. First off, it's declared like this, which we'll break that down. Second off, there's a bunch of instance functions here, and these are basically manually implementing these functions. You know how expression derives these? That's because they are easy to implement. They can effectively be implemented automatically. If you think about it, this tree will always end up with either an int or a use var. And remember, in the expression file, var is just a string. So at the base of this tree will always just be ints and strings, which Haskell already knows how to read, how to show, and how to check if they're equal to each other. That's why you can automatically derive these types. However, accumulators are a bit more messy. An accumulator is defined as a type which takes two other types and stores them inside. And because they can be any type, then you need to manually define these functions instead of just saying, eh, derive it for me. What this line here means is it's a bit like a generic class in Java or C++, if you all are, all are familiar with those. It is a type which has other types of things inside of it, and that's not necessarily set in stone. It's very similar to how a list works. A list holds a type of things inside of it, but you can decide as the coder what that type is. You can have a list of strings, a list of ints, a list of Honda Chevys, I don't know. And you don't have to declare a separate list type for each type you want to hold. It is generic. It is just a list, and it handles all types equally. So what accumulator would basically look like in another language is accumulator, where you define the two types right out front, and the first type, there is an array of that type inside of the accumulator. The second type, there is just one of that thing. Let me make this a bit smaller again. And so just for example, up here, if I make an accumulator with an array of ints and a single string, then that is an accumulator of type int string. Meanwhile, if I have an accumulator of a bunch of different strings and a single integer, that is an accumulator of string and int. So just like how a list is a data object which holds a bunch of things of another type, an accumulator is basically just a list that also holds another thing. That's really all it is. This is the list right here, and then it holds one more thing on the side that can be of another type. So you can have a list of strings and then an int on the side. Now, getting back to the actual homework assignment, I'll cover all this in a moment because it is important, but let's ground ourselves and remind ourselves what the objective is. We want to make a function called extract lets that takes an expression 
and returns an accumulator. Now, this accumulator has two types. It's a bit hard to understand because you technically have three types here, but the first type is a pair of variables and expressions. So just like we saw in the example input and output, the accumulator, the list should hold a bunch of pairs, and those pairs specifically have to be of the type variable, then expression. Pair, variable, then expression. And the second type, the thing that it only holds one of, should also be an expression. And again, this is explained in the text, but this uh, set of pairs should be the contents of all the let statements, all the values that the variables are assigned to, and this expression should be the rest of the tree without any of the let statements in it. So the second thing is the cleaned or pruned tree, and the first thing is a list of variables. And now we get into the how of this, and that is very difficult for me to explain without giving you the answers, which I'd rather not do, uh, partially due to academic integrity, that's definitely the main reason, and also partially because I want to release this publicly and I can't give the answers out publicly. So I am just going to try and re-explain some of the concepts we covered in class that people might not have understood the first time, such as applicatives and how container types work in Haskell. So just as a uh, basic demo here, <clears throat> I have some Haskell code here, and I define f as plus 5. So f is a function that takes one argument and adds 5 to it, because plus is a function that takes two arguments, and I've already given it one argument, so it just needs one more. Then I define a as 3, and I will output calling f on a. If I run this, you see it outputs 8. Exactly what we expect. Now this gets trickier when we have containers, like accumulators. What happens if I try and call f on a when a is inside of a container, like a list, or something more simple, a maybe? I know maybes were kind of weird for most people, but they end up being simpler to use for demonstrations because they only hold one thing, and when you get into the fact that lists hold multiple things, demonstrations can quickly become difficult. So we're going to pretend that lists don't exist, and we're just going to use maybes. If you recall from the lecture, a maybe is defined a bit similar to how the expression is defined. A maybe is an abstract parent class, so you can never actually have an object that is a maybe. A maybe is just a sort of umbrella category, and it has two different children. One of the children is just nothing. The word nothing doesn't mean anything. It's basically an enumeration, if you're familiar with that concept. It is just a word for one of the types it can be. Nothing doesn't have a value. It can't hold anything else. It is just nothing. The other type of value it can have is a just, and a just holds a single value, just like how a use holds a variable, or how a variable holds a string. So I could very easily make the variable class behave like a maybe if I had it like this, where it had two different things it could be, and one of them was nothing. I basically just recreated the nothing class. I basically just recreated the maybe class. How we use it is a bit more difficult. I want to add 5 to this 4. However, I can't because Haskell doesn't see the 4 it sees the just, and it doesn't know how to add 5 to a just. And this kind of makes sense if you think about more uh, complicated data structures like a hash map. How do you add 5 to a hash map? The hash map might not even have numbers in it. So this will give you an error. It won't even compile, you'll get red highlighting, and Haskell will scream at you. So the way we solve this, which we covered fairly early in class, and which I think most people understood, is the F map. Now, it's very easy to think that fmap is this fancy function that can somehow know how to do things with containers. That's not what it does. If you go back to the accumulator class, you'll see that it implements the functor interface, and the functor interface has one function called fmap. 
And this is where it is defined what accumulator will do when you try to call a function on the entire goddamn accumulator. So if I have just for inside, wrapped inside this just, and I have this function plus 5, when I fmap f onto a, that doesn't run code inside of some big fmap uh, defined elsewhere. It just knows that because uh, the maybe type is a functor, it must have implemented fmap somewhere in its code. So it goes into this definition here and knows fmap, okay, we have a function, and we have our thing. In this case, we have just for. And it calls the function on the thing inside of the just. And voila, we get just 9. So it adds the 5 to the 4, and the result is still inside of a just. This is very important for the homework because you need to recursively call extract lets. You are traversing a tree, after all, and trees in just about every language, not even Haskell, are powered by recursiveness. So within the definition of extract lets, you will need to be calling extract lets, and that will be returning accumulators for you. And because you need to do things to that expression inside, you may need to be calling things not on the accumulator itself, but on the expression inside of that accumulator. Going back to the accumulator definition. To get more advanced with it, the next step of functors is applicatives. And the reason we use applicatives is because sometimes our functions are wrapped inside of things too. Applicatives are what you use when both your function and your argument are wrapped inside of something. So maybe you have a list of single argument functions and a list of numbers to feed them to. You could have a list that has plus one and minus one inside of it, and a list that has five, four, three, two, one inside of it. And if you apply that list of functions to a list of arguments, it will call each of those functions on each of the arguments. But you can't just, hold on, you can't just call a function on an argument because they happen to be wrapped inside the same type. That wouldn't always work. Again, assume you have this accumulator class. If you didn't implement the applicative interface, it wouldn't know how to combine them. After all, it has a list inside of it, and it also has this other thing. How does it know what you want to do when you try to combine a function inside of an accumulator and a value inside of an accumulator? If you just combine them, it will give you an error. So what we do is we implement applicative. And inside of this, we tell it how to do two things. Applicative is effectively a Java interface, which has two functions that your class needs to implement. The first is pure x, which is basically a way of wrapping something inside of your class. So the pure x for list would just be putting x inside of a list if I want to convert 5 to a list. It stands to reason that I would just put 5 inside of a list, right? And in this case, pure x creates a new accumulator with an empty list to wrap x inside of. And again, whenever you are tempted to ask yourself, what does x, what does pure do in Haskell, and you try to Google how pure works, you're not going to get a very helpful answer because, quite simply, pure does whatever your data type tells it to do. Googling pure is never going to be helpful. <laughs> you, will, you will never get help doing that. You just have to look at the documented code because Google doesn't know what you have told pure to do, and there's no real standard for it. And the second most important part is this right here. This is called the app function, and you use it just as you would a plus sign, or a minus sign, or a multiply sign. You put it in between two things. And what you put it in between, specifically, is a function wrapped inside of your container class, like a function inside of a list, or a function inside of an accumulator, and an argument also wrapped inside of the same type of container, whether it be a maybe, a list, or an accumulator. And then what it 
does, the way it calls that function is again entirely defined by how you, the programmer, define it. In this case, the accumulator class he has given us will combine the contents of these lists because the first type will always end up being a list. I'll bring this up. This will always be a list of whatever type you call it. And so it will combine those and it will call the function. Sorry, I'm using the monad. I'll just get rid of that for now. And it will call the function in the first container on the argument in the second container. And these restrictions are very important to remember because whenever you want to use this symbol, you need to make sure that there is some kind of function on this side and some kind of argument on this side. That is going to be key for this homework. So the way you can combine plus five inside of adjust and four inside of adjust is just by using this symbol. And that is unfortunately the end of what I prepared. But if you run this, you can see it is just nine. Again, still wrapped inside of the same wrapper we were using for our data types before. And the next part of this is where I am unfortunately going to kind of have to admit defeat because I don't know how I can help you much further without giving you answers. Those ideas I just explained, how you use applicatives, what they're for in the first place, why you would want to use them, that is, uh, to put it plainly, important. <laughs> the one other thing I can think of explaining is that these functions, as defined here, these aren't just type declarations. These aren't just headers. I wasn't really representing them properly when I made them look like class headers. They are also functions. When I said that this line of code is doing all of this, I wasn't exaggerating. This is both the type declaration telling you that add is a thing which extends expr. It is also telling you what the constructor function is. Add expr expr is a function. You can open up your terminal and you can call add int5 int2 and it will return you an object of type add with those two expressions inside of it. And like any other function, you can wrap that inside of uh, containers like justs, like lists, or like accumulators, which you might need to use for this homework, and then you can call applicatives on it. Because, and this is, I, I think, the closest I can get to the answer without giving it to you, when you call this recursively, it will be giving you accumulators with expressions inside of them. And the add constructor wants expressions. It does not want accumulators with expressions. So if you, hypothetically, wanted to build an add statement out of the nodes inside of your accursed tree, it might behoove you to put the function add inside of an accumulator and then using this little symbol apply that add function to an accumulator that holds the expressions you want to put inside of it well i'm confident enough to say that dang that's a lot of info i yeah. concur with that statement <laughs> <laughs> it's it's gonna it's gonna have to take a couple of rewatches to get it all straight not gonna lie would it help if i maybe ran through some examples preferred if you can yes please okay i, th I think i can run through some examples without spoiling anything so Thanks, i'm just G. gonna open up <laughs> you're welcome open up ghci uh load up stop that exercises one and just load in accumulator and expression before I mentioned that the node tree assignment was very similar to this one, do you remember how, if you want to modify a node tree, how you basically do that is you recurse over it, and you pretty much rebuild it from the ground up, right? I'm pretty sure that seems strange to all of us, but if we wanted to do, to do something like mirror it so that all the left nodes are on the right, we basically have to call the node constructor all over again to recreate the entire thing, yeah? We have to do... The same thing here, at least for the first function. So you might need to do something like uh, add int 5 
int 3. And you can see that was a valid statement. That gave me a math expression where I add 5 and 3 together. So I'll say a equals add int 5 and 3. Now, when you are calling this function, <clears throat> you call it recursively, and that means it's not going to be returning a nice and tidy expression. It's going to be re uh, returning an accumulator with an expression inside of it. So what if I say b equals an accumulator, and I'll just create an empty list uh, accumulator with nothing of int 3. That's perfectly allowable, and you can see this is what I have. It's exactly what it says. I cannot now say uh, c equals add b and int 3. b has, oh, I'll make it 5 so we can differentiate. This isn't allowed. Whoa, badness because it doesn't want an accumulator with an expression inside of it. It just wants a nice and tidy accumulator. It, it just wants a nice and tidy expression. It doesn't know how to go inside and get what it wants, because if you think about it, I could just as easily have said, uh, accumulator, boom. And I could have put int four inside of that. So if I don't tell it, how to get the expressions out of here, it doesn't know which expression to add. C equals add Ooh. this yank. If I do that, and int 5. Yep, that's still an error. So if I'm trying to rebuild my node tree from the ground up to, say, hypothetically, get rid of all the let statements, one way I could do this is by saying uh, accumulator empty list and then put the add function in it. And then I could apply that to an accumulator. Whoop, this needs to be in parentheses. Accumulator of nothing and int 3. And also apply accumulator of int 2. This should work, I believe. There we go. Now I have an accumulator, which inside of it is stored add three and two. And if you look at it, the syntax is fairly reminiscent of how I would do this if they weren't wrapped inside accumulators. So if I just do that, you can see add, add, int three, int three, int two, int two. These symbols, whenever you, uh, whenever you see these, just assume they mean Apply the thing on the right to the function on the left. Remember that one constraint. The thing on the left always has to have a function inside of it. Always, always, always. No exceptions that I know of. I'm still a student like you. But no exceptions that I know of. In this case, the function is the add constructor. This is a function which will return an add object. Kind of. That's one way of thinking about it. When I say just this... Uh, this might give me an error. When I just say that, uh, it gives you this bastard of a sentence, which means, if I can translate, it is an accumulator that has add int 3 inside of it. And much like when I said uh, plus 5, this is a function that is half-filled. It still needs a second argument. So it is a function that is holding this information inside of it. It is the add function, yes, and it knows the first argument is 3, but it still needs a second argument, which is why it's like this. It is an accumulator that is holding a function. So if I s select... Bleh. Love Emacs. Love it. If I say A equals this, I can then say A apply accumulator empty list of int three and that will give me my nice and tidy accumulator object because i have taken a which is this function which needs an argument and i have applied the argument inside of this accumulator <coughs> sweet jesus my throat does that example make sense it's a lot smaller yes. should be simpler okay good yes times a million i like that one <laughs> they're lovely things aren't they Indeed. so 
Time to explain a little more advanced stuff using that example. Let's go back to the accumulator. Here we go. So you can see when you implement the applicative interface. You implement this function, the app function. You tell it how to combine a function inside of the wrapper with an argument inside of the wrapper, which we did here. It would be, in fact, a lot simpler to just say uh, acum empty plus five app acum empty list three. You can see here, function needs an argument, argument, boom, eight inside of the wrapper function. However, there is also this pure function. And like I said, don't Google what pure does because it only does what you tell it to do in your code. If you try and look up a broad scope definition of it, it will be horribly complicated. And I don't know why any of the definitions online don't just tell you it does whatever you told it to do in your code, moron. Because it's very easy to go on click holes on Google and Wikipedia of what a applicative pure function does and learn absolutely fucking nothing. But all it does here is if you call pure on a value, it will create an accumulator with an empty list and that value. And oh shit, that's what I was doing manually this whole time. So I could very easily do what I was telling you to do before by saying... Uh, pure add app pure and three app and then I'm pretty sure I need to put an accumulator at some point in here so it knows what type pure is supposed to be because every single class that implements applicative has a pure function if I don't give it a type like an accumulator it says okay I know you want me to call pure but what type am I calling it on so I can say accumulator empty list of in four. And I might need to put this in parentheses. I'll see if this compiles. And it does. And you can see it gives me the exact same result, but I changed the numbers, so those are different. And this is a lot easier to read than this Who's Magasin. So that's what the pure is for. It just saves you from having to create a bunch of empty parameters for your wrapper class. It's sort of like a default. When you want to put something inside of your class, instead of having to call the constructor, because remember, the name of the thing is a constructor, so I'm just calling the constructor here. I'm providing the first argument, which is an empty list, and I'm providing it the second argument, which is the add function. Pure provides an alternative. It's basically a default value for the constructor, so you can call the constructor on just one argument, and it will automatically do the rest. If I were to call... Uh, pure plus f eh, pure plus five, and then app it with a just three. It knows to automatically convert this plus five into a just plus five. Boom. Because pure is hyper overloaded with just about every applicative container class in Haskell and it automatically knows how to do it, you don't have to worry, oh, how do I wrap a function in adjust again? Do I have to do anything weird? No, nah, just call pure, assume it's implemented properly. At some point in the future, he will probably force us to make our own pure functions, and when he does, just remember, the point of the pure function is to basically be a default constructor that takes a single value and does all of the other constructor stuff automatically. That's all that applicative is. Applicative is an interface class. Uh, sorry, it's an interface. And if you implement it, then your container class, like list or maybe or accumulator, can call wrapped argument, can call wrapped functions on equally wrapped arguments. You can call lists of functions on lists of argu arguments. You can call just functions on just arguments. And the pure is just a convenience thing to make a, to wrap a value in that function. You can call pure x with lists to wrap x in a list. You can call pure x on maybes to wrap x in adjust. And you can call pure in an accumulator here to wrap x in an accumulator with nothing inside of it. I will redo this explanation because it would benefit you to hear it in a much more simple fashion. Uh, 
have an accumulator. A equals a cum. So I'm calling the accumulator constructor with an empty list and the number five. That works? Okay, great, thank you. For this assignment, you will need to add things to this internal list because, remember the specifications, you need to be tracking the variable values inside of this accumulator's list as you traverse through the tree. The way, as implemented, you can add things to this list, easiest way I can think of is using this add function and the applicatives. Add for app A. Now notice when I do that, it adds four to this list. How the hell? Well, add is a function defined in here. A function that has a name which is criminally vague, if I may say so. But what that function does is it accepts anything and it returns an accumulator where the first type is the same type as that thing. So I called it on, I said add four. So the type of this list is now forever a list of ints. And the second type is of y goes to y. Well, what does that mean? It means that inside of this accumulator is stored a function that accepts type y and returns type y. If you think about it, the function plus five is the same. That accepts a and returns a. The only constraint is that a has to be a number. In this case, there is no such constraint. And the function in this case is id. And I remember what I said, id of anything equals that thing, no matter how complex it is. So if I say id a, it returns what a was declared as. If I say id 5, it returns that thing. So by putting id inside of any kind of wrapper class, like list, or like maybe, or like accumulator, you can use applicatives to do the kind of side effects that happen when you apply things, such as concatenating lists, without actually doing anything to the arguments in your main accumulator. So if you were, I don't know, hypothetically rebuilding an entire binary tree, and you wanted to record certain nodes, then when you call your recursive function on that tree, you can call add on the accumulator that you get returned to add certain values to the accumulator as it sort of climbs up the recursive uh, tree structure. And one, one last piece of advice I can give that isn't immediately apparent is that because of how Exper is defined, you can take advantage of Haskell uh, type matching. Type matching is one of the genuinely magical things of Haskell that you can't really get in other languages. When you call this function on an expression, whereas in other languages where you have inheritance, like I laid out in the... Uh, no, stop that. Where you have inheritance similar to how I laid it out in my terrible Java explanation, Haskell can automatically just check what type you pass when you call the function. So you can basically just declare entirely different functions depending on what you pass it, and just say that it has to take an expression one way or another. So I can say, uh, extract let's uh, int x equals undefined, and then extract let's uh, add x y equals undefined, etc., etc., and just adding these other words to see how many uh, are arguments that should have inside of it. And I believe you need to wrap these in parentheses, otherwise it'll give you errors. There we go. But you can use this as an easy way of handling the different types of nodes. You don't have to use if statements to say, okay, uh, when I call it on a node, if it's an int, do this. If it's an add, do this. You don't have to put in express if statements. This pattern matching will automatically do that for you. So you can just have completely different cases for each type of node in this math binary tree we have for ourselves. Does that make sense? I believe so. Okay. I know when you just have expression in the argument field here, it can be difficult to understand what you're really getting, but it is important to understand that you can break down the thing that you're getting past, because you know expression has to be one of these types. You can just make a case for every type, and then you know you have all your bases covered. 
you don't have to worry about a situation where you can't break it down into one of these. Gotcha. Okay, that makes more sense. Yes. All right. Uh, I think that's all I have, at least in terms of stuff that's pertinent to this homework. Once I have it cleaned up, I will uh, re-upload it.